there are many different figures over the history of letter writing and diaries and journals, or what Montaigne called essay. Of course, today, the form and its parameters is a little different. But for Montaigne, it was just trying out thoughts. And of course, armed with his excruciatingly vast knowledge of Latin and Greek writing, and his keen mind, and his solitude in that nice tower all by himself. Of course, he had the time to think through these things and to write them down for posterity. I'm thinking of the Zibaldone from Leopardi, even the waste books, as they were called, by Lichtenberg. And of course, the diaries of Virginia Woolf, the notebooks from Henry James. And thankfully for us and for Lydia Davis, who translated Madame Bovary, the letters of Flaubert. And now, thankfully, we have the abundant ambrosial fruit of Lydia Davis's own notebooks. Hey everybody, thank you for watching Leaf by Leaf. Today I'm talking about Essays 1 and Essays 2 by Lydia Davis, both volumes put out by Fair, Strauss, and Giroux. What sets the two volumes apart is that Essays 1 is on writing, as in the craft and process of writing, on writers, some on translation, but also on artists and photography. It's a variegated hodgepodge of different writings and thinking from Lydia Davis. I greatly enjoyed every single one of its essays. In fact, when I first started reading the volume, I was just gonna pick and choose. Read this about Proust here, and this about Flaubert here, and then, okay, well, I'm a little interested in uh, Maurice Blanchot, whom I still haven't read, and I didn't realize that Lydia Davis had translated his novel Death Sentence and his essays, The, the Gaze of Orpheus. But before I knew it, after a few days, I had read every single essay hopping around, because once you start, you realize what an addictive voice Lydia Davis has, and coupled with, of course, her vast knowledge. But somehow she pulls this off in such a way to where she doesn't come off like a, a pedant or the negative connotation that we attach to elitist. She comes at it more as what she would call the geek of the literary world or the nerd of the literary world, which is what she tells us that translators sort of see themselves as because they get down deep, deep, deep into the minutia of sentences and syntax, and they sort of geek out on discoveries they make or problems that they bring to each other. It's just that raw, genuine passion for translation, for literature, for dictionary reading, for chasing down etymological rabbit trails. For the other volume, Essays 2, it's much more singular in focus. It is about the discipline, the field, the profession that she has mastered and is most known for, which is translation. A large chunk of it is devoted to her sharing things that she learned throughout her journey of translating the first volume of A la Recherche du Temps Perdu, which is, of course, Swan's Way. I remember reading Lydia Davis's translation when it first came out from Penguin Deluxe, when they announced what they were doing, getting a different translator from different parts of the English speaking world to do each volume. And I loved it. I loved how crisp the prose was. It wasn't as cluttered as the Scott Moncrief edition, which is of course then updated by Terence Kilmartin. That's the one I had read previously. I've now read Lydia Davis's Swan's Way three times. And now I can appreciate her translation on a completely different level and deeper level. One single word emerged with each of the volumes. For the first, curiosity. It was the prevailing word, the prevailing theme. You'll find in these essays that she is a habitual note taker, but she has turned this habitual note taking into a, an art and a way of life from sitting at the gate in an airport and just observing conversations around her, she can download short stories simply straight from her mind out onto the page. She did take one writing workshop, and that was with none other than Grace Paley. Lydia Davis has her own style and brand of short stories 
Ferris, Strauss, and Giroux has put out a volume of them. They're typically very short. They're in the vein more of Diane Williams, maybe with a little more coherence, a little more conventional coherence, let's say, than Diane Williams, but that brevity that still can be considered whole. Lydia Davis has such a deep relationship and love for language that you can't help but catch the fever. Reading her essays for me recalled reading and listening to Grammar Girl, whom I was obsessed with for a while. They also reminded me of Michael Durda, especially Durda's love for dictionaries and encyclopedias and Fowler's modern English usage and the writer's thesaurus. She reminded me at times of Karen Elizabeth Gordon and her extremely lively books on syntax and sentences and grammar. I was reminded of The Last Samurai. It's kind of pointless to hold this book up because I lost the uh, dust jacket, so it doesn't look pre very presentable. It could really be any book, but Helen DeWitt has this amazing novel called The Last Samurai. It has nothing to do with the Tom Cruise film, which is what I always have to tell people uh, when they see it on my shelves or, or I first mention the name. It awakened me to a view of and a passion for language and especially foreign languages and learning languages and translation. When I finished reading this book years ago, I immediately wanted to learn every language in the world and read in it and write in it. In terms of the discipline of translation in particular, it reminded me of my times with this book. This is one of my favorite books of all time. This is from Douglas R. Hofstadter. It's called Le Tombeau de Mecho, in praise of the music of language. And it stems out of his obsession with this old French poem that starts off, Ma mignon, je vous donne le bonjour. And it keeps going. And it's just this really thin poem that he found in the middle of a page. But if you heard that, ma mignon, je vous donne le bonjour. It's three beats, so three syllables all the way down. And he got obsessed with translating it. He goes all over the place. Only Douglas Hofstadter could produce a 700 page book on the discipline of translation and every page be intensely stimulating. But so it was also with Lydia Davis. Ultimately, at the end of reading through her essays, you will realize that Lydia Davis, in her way, is exemplifying and thus teaching us how to read and write. The standout essays in her first collection for me were Gustave Flaubert's Madame Bovary. You may have heard that Flaubert is notable for his use of irony. Of course, Madame Bovary in particular is pointed to as the first realist novel, but Davis really gets in there in this essay and digs out the subtleties of his layered tapestry of irony. Her essay, As I Was Reading, may be my absolute favorite in the first collection of essays. Uh, she's basically trying to read a book, I think on French history or something, and she gets distracted by the word millennium. And that starts off a whole rabbit trail all over the place, but you just so enjoy the ride because you're seeing her mind at work, which is a very difficult thing to capture that Lydia Davis does so well, is her mind is being drawn to all these different places and making all these connections and going and grabbing this dictionary here and this dictionary here and then asking questions of it. But it's like a thrill ride for us to read and it excites us and stirs again our curiosity, which is my prevailing word for the first set of essays. By the end of it, you'll be buying all kinds of different dictionaries to keep in your house to go on these same sorts of adventures. She has an essay called Fragmentary or Unfinished, and this is a very stimulating essay that considers Roland Barthes, Joubert, Hodelin, Flaubert, Malachme. She's looking at their different uses of fragments, and she comes up with these wonderful metaphors for understanding the different ways we could look at what's called a fragment, but may actually be whole in and of itself. And her reading of the shepherd's psalm at Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. She goes through and does a textual analysis of this psalm that deepened my appreciation for it and sent me straight to my KJV yet again. Her themes, her essays are all over the place and, and mashed up from over four decades of writing. Proust, Joyce, Roddy Doyle, Grace Paley, Thomas Hardy, Dennis Johnson, John Ashbery, 
Rambeau, Flaubert, Joseph Cornell, Mallarmé, Blanchot, Bach, Nabokov, Karl Ava Knosgord, Jane Bowles, Joan Mitchell, Samuel Beckett, whom she loves, Peter Hanke, and again, Joubert and Holderlin among many others. She's even got a little essay in here on young Pinchon, considering his short stories in the collection Slow Reader, and she says this of The Secret Integration. There is a quiet, lyrical humanity in this story, an almost unapologetic gentleness, inviting and inclusive, that contrasts with the weightier, complex pessimism and bravado of the later novels. She's got a sense of humor that comes out again and again. Again, it reminds me of reading Michael Durda's essays. She breaks down her process of revision. She's huge on revision. She talks about patience. Be, patience and revision are huge qualities that a writer needs to possess, needs to harness. And she's walking through her revisions of this very, very short piece. And I didn't notice that she had misspelled besieged. But she walks through how she tinkered with all of it, and the very last sentence of the essay says, by the time of the final version, I knew how to spell besieged, which is just a, a very humorous, clever thing to end on. For the craft of writing, she gives us 30 tips on writing that should not be missed by any aspiring writer. There's also a brief piece where uh, she gives us five of her favorite short stories, Dante and the Lobster by Samuel Beckett, and then she follows that by saying anything by Beckett, of course. Wants by Grace Paley. Everything that rises must converge from Flannery O'Connor. Isaac Babel's You Must Know Everything. And Franz Kafka's The Burrow. Again, in that essay on the fragments, she defines a fragment thus. Text that works with silence, ellipsis, abbreviation, suggesting that something is missing, but that has the effect of a complete experience. She's big on clarity. She talks about how when you're revising a sentence, which you should do over and over, you're not only revising the sentence, but you're revising the thought behind the sentence. And so you're not only trying to improve your craft of writing, but your ability to articulate and make clear your thoughts. And she exemplifies this in every single one of her essays. The prose is extremely lucid and flows from one thought to another perfectly. Like I said, she's a huge advocate of dictionary reading. She says, I'm sure I learned something about writing clear and exact prose from the very precise definitions in a dictionary. Don't underestimate the value of spending time wondering about something. You are more alert to picking up clues when you're wondering about something. The whole subject of whatever you're wondering about has time to expand and develop in your mind before you find the answer. This is a tip not only for an aspiring writer, but for an aspiring good reader. Learn to focus intently on one thing uninterrupted for a long time. If one thing sums up the Lydia Davis that comes through in this first volume of essays, it's, so I started looking here and there to see what I could find out. Essays 2, again, is much more singular in focus. And the word that sort of prevailed for me in this volume of essays was determination. That drive where she says again and again, I want to do this myself. If the first volume of essays can be encapsulated with the word curiosity, and this one with the word determination, then what determination is to me, or what the second volume of essays is to me, compared to the first volume, is curiosity in action. So the eternally curious Lydia Davis from her first collection is now in action in the second volume. What impressed me the most is Davis's ability to expose her mind in action. Now this is the same thing that happens in Le Tombeau de Merho by Douglas R. Hofstadter, but he's really interesting in interested in capturing the neurological processes and consciousness, what's happening in the mind. Whereas Davis is showing us in a much more applied level. She's showing, I found this and went to this resource found this about it, came back, you know, that shed light, so then this is the next step I took. And because of it, this volume is perfect for translators or anyone interested in the act of translation, the discipline of translation in general. This volume will also appeal 
to Proust fans, of which I proudly proclaim myself one. I think that aside from William T. Volman, Proust has the most videos on this channel. A great chunk of the book is dedicated again to her sharing with us at a very detailed level things that she learned while translating and studying Proust. And again, we get that comment on dictionary reading in her life. She says, it is possible that in the course of my decades of translating, I have read more in my French dictionaries than I have in French literature itself. But these essays don't limit themselves just to French translations of Blanchot and Flaubert and Proust. She also shares with us her learning and dipping into and, and translating of the two languages of Norway, Bakhmol and Nynorsk. And Nynorsk, if I'm not mistaken, is what Jan Fossa writes in, and it lends itself much more to poetic writing than Bakhmol. Like she gives us in the first volume of essays, the 30 tips on writing, in this one she gives us 21 pleasures of translating. She firmly believes that every single person should learn at least one foreign language and translate at least one piece of writing in their lifetime. She is what's called a close translator, and she breaks down her process of close translating at levels I didn't even know existed. In her essay, Hammers and Hoofbeats, Rhythms and Syntactical Patterns in Proust's Swan's Way, she gets into her process whereby she wanted to understand, put herself in the mind of the different sounds and rhythms that Proust would have heard in his day, from, like she said, hammers to hoofbeats. She thought about if someone were in a kitchen beating something and she goes and does research and observation and discerns that there's a four beat rhythm, dot, 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 to someone beating a spoon against the side of a pan. She determines the one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, of a horse walking and bobbing its head. She thinks about uh, how there's a lack of noise from automobiles and other ambient noises that fill our spaces today where Proust at his window from his writing room or from his bed, he would have heard much more clearly the clanging of church bells from even blocks away. She walks us through this whole compendium. She loves lists. She loves enumerations. She loves taxonomies. And she walks us through this list she puts together of all these different sounds, not only the sounds, but their concomitant rhythms. And then she comes through his prose and she makes these connections and maps them to his prose and how these things that he heard in his day came out in his writing. It's a remarkable essay. She is so passionate and so good at what she does that she makes translation seem simple. But she does tell us again and again, no choice is simple even one that seems obvious. She talks about other translators, Margaret Ewell Costa, Elliot Weinberger, Anne Goldstein, Don Bartlett, Michael Hoffman. And of course, she talks a lot about the decisions that Scott Moncrief and Terence Kilmartin and Grieve all made in translating Proust. She shows over and over again where Scott Moncrief added a lot to what Proust had. And that's what I mean by the cluttering of Proust, and she likes to clear that out in her translations. Or there's a metaphor that completely takes on a different type of object as its analog. She puts it back in its original object that Proust used. A lot of people had criticized Davis's translation of Swan's Way, saying that it was too plain. And I think in these essays, she does an incredible job in justifying her choices and in showing how hers is actually closer to an isomorphic English analog to Proust's French. She puts constraints on herself, such as making sure that she gets the English lexicon or English dictionary of Proust's day so that she won't use any English words that he himself wouldn't have used. Again, she gives us insight into Flaubert. Flaubert likes to create a traditional writerly effect, romantic or sentimental. And then when we are well entranced, bring us back down to reality with a thud by offering us a mundane, preferably earthy image. Truffles in this scene, potatoes in a later one. One of the pleasures of translation that she gives us is that you are entering not only the author, 
but another culture for longer or shorter periods of time. So translation is a very deep sort of armchair travel. As a translator, you are both a ventriloquist and a chameleon. As to her preference for literature, she says, the novel is almost always more interesting when plot is not primary. She definitely enjoys craft over content. She gives us advice on how to read Proust. It is best experienced for most in the way it was meant to be, in the full, slow reading and rereading of every word in complete submission to Proust's subtle psychological analyses, his precise portraits, his compassionate humor, his richly colored and lyrical landscapes, his extended digressions, his architectonic sentences, his symphonic structures, his perfect formal designs. She comes close to what Gass does for Henry James in his spindle diagrams, and she shows us how Proust uses hypotaxis, not parataxis, which is just tacking things together, uh, but hypotaxis, where it's this, what she calls a pyramid of subordinate clauses. And she'll break down and diagram sentences that do this in a beautiful way. Along the way, she gives us little anecdotes, such as during the time of Proust pinning those letters to his neighbor who lived ab above, chiefly complaining about noise, which Davis translated. She says that Kafka at about this time was recording the same sorts of complaints in his diaries, though he liked to turn them into small stories about what fantastic things these neighbors might be doing. Another standout essay in this one is An Alphabet in Progress of Proust Translation Observations from Aurore to Zoot. And she structures the beginning of the essay like a table of contents from a dictionary. This is, I think, the longest piece in here. And I thought that it would get a little tiresome of its form, but it reminded me of the setup that Roland Bach uses in A Lover's Discourse, where for each letter that drives a thought or a word. But then as put into practice by Lydia Davis, she is pulling from her very notebook in which she captured all these incredible little problems and observations and discoveries during her time translating Proust and has them here to share with us. And even though I'm not a translator, yes, I am a Proust fan, but there's something again that Davis has and can voice in her writing that really causes us to, to again, catch that fever, catch that passion for language and translation. In the essay, Loaf or Hot Water Bottle, she really walks through step-by-step step her process of translation. For example, she says, when I approach a translation, I don't generally read the book first. I like to translate more or less blind, looking only a paragraph or a page ahead. And she talks about how a lot of translators actually do this. Number two, she doesn't want any further knowledge of Proust himself or his life to influence the way she reads the book. So she decided not to seek out ahead of time any biographical material or, or critical writings that discuss his style or themes. And that's exactly how I approach reading. When I go to read someone for the first time, I, I try as best I can to just go in blind and experience the work of art without any predispositions coming to the table. If you're interested in photography, art, literature, translating, Proust, French, Spanish, Nynorsk, Dutch. If you enjoy reading essays, if you want more insight into your craft as a writer, if you want to learn to read more attentively and with more curiosity and more determination, which again is curiosity in action, then I highly, highly recommend Essays 1 and Essays 2 by Lydia Davis out in hardcovers from Ferrer, Strauss, and Giroux.